the construction of the Inga one and two dams, which happened decades ago in the 70s and 80s, displaced thousands without compensation. That displacement resulted in the impoverishment of thousands of people over multiple generations, most of whom would be displaced again if construction of the hotly debated Inga three dam goes ahead. So Inga III's reservoir would displace an estimated 10,000 people, the majority of whom would lose both their land and their livelihood. And this is often the case with other hydropower projects as well. The dam's construction would create only 3,000 temporary jobs and only a few hundred permanent jobs after its completion. So overall, the dam will destroy thousands more jobs than it creates. And again, that is the case the world over with large hydropower projects. With construction of Inga 3, thousands of farmers would also be rendered landless. This would jeopardize, this would jeopardize food security and the basis of an agrarian economy, while communities depending on fishing would also be significantly impacted. And as is the case in many scenarios across the world, women would be particularly harshly impacted by the construction of this dam. They would be economically disempowered and would no longer be able to engage in farming for sustenance or selling produce at markets to provide for themselves and their families. The relocation and displacement of communities and indigenous peoples can have other resulting negative impacts like the loss of culture, the loss of traditional ways of living and working, and the loss of traditional forms of land ownership and community structures. This would be the case if the proposed Baines hydropower project went ahead on the Kunene River bordering Namibia and Angola. We are currently working with the Ovahimba people, which are an indigenous group in Namibia and Angola, in opposing the construction of this hydropower project. So the transboundary Kunene River is the ancestral home of the Himba people, and they have lived there for over 500 years. The Kunene River is one of just five perennial rivers in Namibia and has supported the ancient semi-nomadic Himba people throughout the years. The Himba's economic independence is directly linked to the land and their livestock. They have retained their way of life as cattle, sheep, and goat farmers with huge herds of up to 500 per family. After successfully opposing a previous dam, the Ipupa Dam in the 1990s, the Himba are now once again faced with the threat of displacement by the proposed Baines Dam, which is a binational project being developed by Angola and Namibia on the Kunene River. The project aims to provide power to both those countries, which in and of itself is a noble aim, but there are other less destructive ways to achieve it through solar and wind power that the countries are not exploring sufficiently. The proposed Baines Dam threatens to destroy the Himba's livelihood and culture. It will flood 57 square kilometers of tribal lands, including ancestral graves, households, grazing lands, cattle posts, and thereby displacing the Himba people entirely. This displacement will disrupt their traditional ways of living and affect their ability to be economically independent. International Rivers embarked on a scoping visit of the Himba communities in January of last year. We held meetings with five Himba communities who would be directly impacted by construction of the dam. In Urakawe, a member of the community aptly summarized their concerns when he stated that, Namibia and Angola Himba are against the dam. They know that there are no benefits. We will suffer if the land is taken away. If Baines goes ahead, it will be war. We are not interested in money, even if they give us a million. We don't want to go to strange places. Many households in this area will be affected. As is the case in many hydropower construction processes, the indigenous Himba people were not adequately consulted with before this project was put on the table. This happens the world over with indigenous and local communities who are made aware of the project at a very late stage and are often not given adequate time to prepare an opposition to the project. Moving on to the environmental impacts, flooding land for a hydroelectric reservoir has an extreme environmental impact. It can destroy forests, wildlife habitats, and disrupt or even destroy entire aquatic ecosystems. And this can happen in a number of ways. The most direct way is that fish 
and other organisms are injured or killed by turbine blades. But apart from direct contact with turbines, there can also be wildlife impacts both within the dam reservoirs of the hydropower station and downstream from the facility. Reservoir water is usually more stagnant than normal river water, which results in above normal amounts of sediments and nutrients, which can cultivate an excess of algae and other aquatic weeds. These weeds can then negatively affect the aquatic ecosystem as a whole by crowding out and killing other river animals and plant life. Most hydroelectric operators are required to release a minimum amount of water at certain times of the year to avoid parts of the river downstream from drying out. But if not released properly, water levels downstream will drop and animal and plant life can be harmed. Even if the water is released timeously, reservoir water is typically low in dissolved oxygen and is colder <coughs> than normal river water. So when it is released, the change in temperature and oxygen levels can have negative impacts on the downstream aquatic ecosystems. In addition to all this, water is also lost through evaporation in dammed reservoirs at higher rates than it is in free-flowing rivers. When a river is blocked, water gathers behind the dam, creating an unnatural stagnant. Bacteria in the water then decompose these plants and animals, and this generates carbon dioxide and methane, a greenhouse gas 86 times more potent than CO2. Let's now consider how these theoretical impacts we just discussed would play out in reality by looking at the expected impacts of the proposed Inga Dam on the Congo River. The Congo Basin is host to an estimated 400 species of mammals, 1,086 species of birds, 216 species of amphibians, countless species of reptiles, and more than 900 species of butterflies. The basin accounts for 80% of savanna gorillas, 4,000 elephants, 9,000 chimpanzees, and numerous species of fish live in the waters of the Congo. More than 230 species have been identified in one pool of the river alone, with around 400 species associated with the river and the Congo basin as a whole. If, Inga 3, if the Inga 3 dam is built, the impact on climate change and biodiversity would be significant. It would flood the Bundi Valley, trapping sediments, causing harmful methane emissions, and harming the climate-regulating mid-Atlantic plume, which is key to the planet's carbon cycle. The Congo Basin is the second largest tropical rainforest in the world, with almost 2 million square kilometers of humid forest. Construction of transmission lines to transport energy generated by the dam will require the clearance of huge corridors of this forest and would destroy animal habitats and ecosystems. There would also be a reduced flow of the Congo River, which will engender a loss of biodiversity and a shift in the dominant water species. High temperatures are expected to cause water evaporation, resulting in dam water levels to drop, which in essence would cause the dam not to generate sufficient electricity. The flooded area of the reservoir would likely create an environment conducive to the breeding of waterbone vectors, such as the malaria-carrying malican mosquito. This will affect the health of local communities and emit climate change-inducing methane. Lastly, it's also important to acknowledge that with increasing droughts due to climate change and Africa's particular susceptibility to this, the level of water in the dam will be reduced which reduces the ability to produce power, rendering the dam less efficient. This really drives home the fact that there are severe cons to hydropower projects in Africa. And if we consider the many harmful impacts, it would be harder to justify this project as opposed to solar and wind power. Parts of Africa have been plagued by dry seasons growing hotter and rainy seasons arriving later. Scientists have warned that this kind of drought is likely to become more frequent and more severe in the coming years as the world begins to feel the effects of climate change on a large scale. For much of 2017, one of the world's least developed countries, Malawi in Southeast Africa, experienced intermittent blackouts as a result of low water levels at the country's largest hydropower plant. In December last year, the situation turned critical and large areas of Malawi turned to complete darkness. 
that is not an isolated case. In, in Africa, where we have severe droughts, this has happened in a number of countries. In late 2015, the Tanzanian government was forced to shut down all its hydroelectric plants following droughts that dried up many of the country's dams. In 2016, the largest hydroelectric plant in sub-Saharan Africa, which is Mozambique's Kohorabasa, found itself in trouble. Two years of droughts brought water levels to record lows, down to 34% of full dam capacity. The impact went well beyond Mozambique as about two thirds of power generated at the facility is sold to South Africa and Zimbabwe. So there's a definite knock on effect. Also located on the Zambezi River is, Zamb is Zambia's largest hydroelectric plant, the Kariba Dam, which is located upstream of Kohorabasa and supplies roughly 40% of Zambia's power demand. Unsurprisingly, in the same year that Kohorabasa experienced record lows, power generation at the Kariba fell by a whopping 75%. To summarize, while hydropower is a form of renewable energy, it is not without negative impacts, some of which can be mitigated by proper and inclusive planning, but others have inevitable negative impacts on the biodiversity and local environment and communities. And these costs must be weighed seriously against the pros, especially in a drought prone continent like Africa where the promise of consistent power from dams is no longer a guaranteed outcome.